Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation on fiber. Now, what I want to start with is this. Everybody take a deep breath. Do it. Take a deep breath. Okay, put your shoulders back. Get them down. Relax a little bit because here's a topic that finally deals with what we can have more of instead of limits or restrictions or foods to avoid. But like you see in this cartoon, oftentimes when it comes to this topic of fiber, it kind of gets a bad reputation for being bland or boring or foods we don't want to eat a lot of. So let's try to find ways to make fiber more interesting. First of all, fiber is a type of carbohydrate, but it's one that the body cannot digest. Therefore, it passes through our digestive tract relatively untouched. You may have heard it called roughage or bulk. Regardless of what you call it, it's a great nutrient that has been linked to a host of disease preventions. There's a lot of different types of fiber and they have different impacts, benefits, and side, effect, side effects, Excuse me, and we'll talk through all of that today. American Heart Association recommends about 25 grams of fiber per day. And they give this recommendation based on a calorie level, but I usually say 25 grams is a good amount to aim for. Unfortunately, the average American is falling shy of this recommendation with about 15 grams of fiber in the common American diet. So obviously a little room for improvement. The reason fiber is emphasized so much from a heart health perspective is exemplified here by the three hearts on the slide. There's five main reasons fiber is great for us, but again, when it comes to heart health, its ability to lower our cholesterol levels, control blood sugars, and help us with weight maintenance, they're second to none. Now, we also know that fiber is important in maintaining or achieving bowel health, and again, like I said earlier, disease prevention. Uh, most notably, we see that with certain types of cancer and even with diabetes but I wanna focus on our three main roles with heart health today. To do that, let's discuss our first category of fibers called natural. And those fall into two classes, soluble and insoluble. Soluble fiber is arguably our best for heart health. In our body, soluble fiber forms a gel and acts kind of like a sponge to soak up cholesterol. It decreases the bad or the LDL cholesterol levels by attaching and binding to the free-floating LDL in our bloodstream and taking it back to the liver where it's removed. Soluble fiber also helps to slow digestion and therefore manage our blood sugars better. And if you've come to my class on diabetes before, you know that diabetes is a precursor for heart disease and a condition in which we really want to best manage to prevent or delay other issues like heart issues. Where we find soluble fiber is in the foods I have listed here. Beans, oats, oat bran, apples, oranges, and legumes like nuts, beans, peas, and seeds. These are gonna be our highest classes or highest types of foods that have soluble fiber. Now what's frustrating is that oftentimes on a food label, you're only going to see dietary fiber. You're not going to see it broken down into the types of fiber it contains. So for that reason, understanding that these are the foods that are going to give you the most bang for your buck in terms of soluble fiber can help ensure you're getting enough. A lot of food sources have multiple types of fiber in them, and we'll talk about that when we compare our soluble fiber to this next category called insoluble fiber. Insoluble, insoluble fiber acts a little bit differently it doesn't dissolve in water, so it kind of acts like a broom to sweep things through our digestive tract. The alliteration I use here, or something I use to help me remember it, is insoluble fiber works on your intestines, okay? Promotes regular bowel movements, and we find it, again, some crossover here in our food groups, but predominantly our whole grains, bran, the exterior of our fruits and vegetables, and again, some of our legumes like nuts and beans. When you eat, let's say, an apple, the peel of your apple is going to be mostly insoluble fiber. The flesh of your apple is a lot of your soluble or heart-healthy fiber. So by eating the entire apple, you're getting both types. 
beans. By eating beans, you're getting both types of fibers, insoluble and soluble, okay? So including a variety of foods in your diet can help ensure you're getting the benefits of different types of fiber, as well as still maximizing the heart health benefit from that soluble type. What we know is that in all of the examples I've given you so far, they are plant-based foods. Encouraging a variety of plant-based foods can't be emphasized enough. You've probably heard me talk about this in all of our classes. Fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds, kind of fits in our legume category. But all of these foods, they're gonna give us, again, pretty good bang for our buck when it comes to fiber content and overall nutrition. Making sure that when you're building your meals or your snacks throughout the day, that you're including fruits, vegetables, and whole grains can do wonders for heart health by nature of the nutrients they provide. And if we think about it in relationship to this plate, just looking at the circle plate itself with those four food groups on it, grains, if they're whole grains, fruits and vegetables, so 75% of our meals are an opportunity to maximize fiber. Now there's other types of fiber out there, so I wanna talk about another large category called supplemental. Just like its name implies, it's coming in the form of supplements and should do just that. Help you meet or help you supplement your recommended intake. Now, please note that fiber supplements don't provide the vitamins and minerals that the whole food sources that contain fiber would. Something like fiber gummies or capsules, fiber powders, well, they can be a great way to be additions to the diet or again, supplements to the diet, they're not going to give you the full range of nutrient benefits you'd see from those fruits or vegetables. I have a couple different brands listed up here. If you look at, um, let's look at the fiber choice. You get three grams of fiber for every two capsules you have. Well, I don't know about you, but the idea of trying to meet my fiber needs, 25 grams a day, means taking 16 capsules of fiber choice. Doesn't sound too tasty. Or mixing in 16 teaspoons of our Benefiber. Doesn't sound too tasty. Use them as a supplement if needed or recommended, but just know that our food choices are generally going to be better to help us really meet our needs. The last class or category of fibers are called added or manufactured. These would be things like inulin or chicory root extract, soluble corn fiber or psyllium husk. And generally speaking, you're going to find these in higher amounts in some of the products like Fiber One bars or cereals, Quest bars, flat out wraps. Like the name implies too, although these are natural fibers, they're added to the food. And so you're going to see relatively high amounts of fiber in the food items. So if you're looking at, let's say, a Fiber One bar. Now this, compared to any other granola bar on the shelf, has way more fiber than what you're gonna see. You see on this nutrition label, dietary fiber, nine grams. That's usually three or four times what you're gonna find compared to others. And it's because that first ingredient, chicory root extract, has been added to this granola bar. Now it's fine, it can be a great way to meet your fiber need, needs, but what I'll tell you is that high amounts of this added fiber particularly if you're not used to it, can cause some pretty negative side effects. Gas, bloating, cramping, diarrhea being among some of the common complaints. I had a nurse who, who offered a few years ago, um, she was in a class, a lecture hall, relatively small, and she had packed two Fiber One bars for breakfast that day. She'd never had them before, but knew they were high fiber. They were delicious. She'd heard from other people that these oats and chocolate was awesome. So she ate two for breakfast and within about 30 minutes, everybody else in class knew she was miserable. You can interpret that how you want. She spent the rest of the afternoon in the bathroom from some cramping and some bloating and some other things she didn't wish me to share publicly, but she did want me to tell you guys that these are not items she'd recommend eating a lot of. Now, some people have no problems with added fibers. 
But if you've never tried these foods, I would recommend you try them at home first when you got nowhere to go, just in case you do have issues. The other quick thing I'll note is yogurt and ice cream is beginning to have fiber added to it, certain brands, I should say. We know that those animal-based foods, those are relatively more of like our dairy type foods, uh, animal foods don't have fiber in them. It's just our plant foods. So something like a yogurt or an ice cream, if it says it has fiber, you can know for sure that it is an added type. And so again, it may cause some of those common symptoms like we'd see here. So short of just eating two and a half fiber one bars every day, let's talk about other ways to maybe maximize or increase fiber intake. When it comes to the grain category, look for whole grains. Whole grains give you the benefit of all three parts, literally the whole grain kernel. We get the bran, the germ, and the endosperm. If we compare that to refined or white grains, what you get in those types of products is just the endosperm, just that middle layer, which has all of the carbs, a tiny bit of protein, but none of the fiber or the other vitamins that you get from the inner and outer parts. The only way to know that you're getting a whole grain though is to check the label. Don't rely on the color of the package or the front of the packaging. Actually flip the product around. The first word in the ingredient list should be whole. And in a perfect world, about half of the grain choices you eat each day should be whole grain in order to maximize fiber intake. If we compare these two labels, now these go vertically, okay? So the bunny bread on the left, its ingredient list is above it. The bunny bread on the right, the ingredient list is below it, okay? But these are both bunny breads. And if you look at the front of the package, can you see where whole, whether it's whole grain or whole wheat is listed in a lot of different places on both packages? can be really frustrating when we rely on the front of this package to make good decisions because marketing gets a lot of free range on these, the front sides. When you flip the bread around, what you see, again, looking at that bread on the left, is that the first ingredient here is whole wheat flour. Well, that checks our box for being a whole grain. Compare that to the bread on the right. The first ingredient, unbleached, enriched wheat flour. Is that a whole grain? No, because the first ingredient isn't whole. If you look down about four rows, there's whole wheat flour in that product, but ingredients are listed in order of dominance, meaning the ingredient in highest amount is listed first. If that first ingredient isn't a whole grain, you're not getting the whole grain product. You're getting an imposter. It might have had caramel color added to it or might have had marketing display on the front used to help trick consumers. We're going to be smarter consumers and understand how best to choose items at the store. Maybe you already have a whole grain bread you like or maybe you've tried them all and you don't much care for it. Bread isn't the only grain option that comes whole grain. Rice, pasta, the flour you use in baking, the bun you put a burger on, an English muffin that you toast in the morning, or a tortilla that you use when cooking a burrito, for example. These are all options for whole grains if you choose them correctly. So again, flip the package around and try to identify, is that first ingredient whole something? Whole wheat, whole oat, whole grain, whole something. Vegetables. Now, I don't know how many people here like the idea of just eating a side salad every day for dinner to increase their vegetable intake. If you can do that, more power to you. But if you get bored with that idea, vary how you serve or eat your veggies. Maybe it's incorporating them into foods you're already consuming. I mean, for crying out loud, Subway created an entire franchise based on the idea of adding vegetables to a sandwich. So when you go home, instead of just making a ham and cheese, why don't you slice up some tomato or throw some pieces of lettuce on them? Think about what you would add to your sandwich at Subway and do it at home. If you're cooking up eggs, they're a great carrier for veggies. Some of my favorite vegetables to add to eggs I have listed here 
But the idea is we don't just have to eat foods by themselves. Sometimes we can eat them in combination and incorporate vegetables accordingly. Adding them in casseroles, putting them, um, roasting them on a, uh, a platter or a cookie sheet, there's the word I'm looking for, can also help too. Sometimes it's the way they're made. Maybe it's spiralizing them. So if you've never tried zucchini noodles, that can be a great way to eat vegetables in place of a pasta. A lower carb way to do it if you're diabetic, but still a tasty way, just a different form. Stir frying them with a little low sodium seasoning or a lower sodium sauce, or even just adding a bit of oil and stir frying them as a side dish can be an awesome way to increase vegetable intake, but still having a variety. Again, the roasting way, if you've never roasted a vegetable, preheat your oven to about 425. Here's some vegetables that roast really well. Wash and cut your veggies. I usually spray mine with a little bit of an olive oil spray, season with pepper, and pop them in that hot oven for about 30 minutes. It can be a nice way to enhance the flavor of some of these foods. Broccoli and cauliflower, they taste awesome roasted if you've never tried that, as do Brussels sprouts. It can be a good way to try vegetables that you otherwise wouldn't eat or that you get bored eating the same way. But the funny thing is, it's kind of hard to eat something you don't have on hand. So make sure vegetables are available. Include them in a variety of forms. Fresh, frozen, canned. Again, if you're doing a canned option, rinse them off. Remember the, all the salt water they can be packed in. Consider some of the convenient ways to buy them if that helps you and you can afford some of the extra expense in those convenient items. So for example, maybe it's a veggie tray. Buying one of those a week so all your vegetables are ready to go. Buying the pre-cut, pre-washed strips of pepper, going down the salad bar at a place like Kroger or Hy-Vee, and adding a couple strips or a couple pieces of already washed and cut vegetables so you have them on hand for the week can also be an easy way to have them. I'll tell you, in our house, we, we love salad, but I hate washing lettuce. I don't know if it's laziness. I don't know what it is. I just hate doing it. So if I buy a head of lettuce, I can guarantee you that I'm going to go home stick it in my crisper drawer, and in about two weeks, I'll remember it. I'll take it out when it's moldy and disgusting, and I'll throw it in the trash. So the $1.89 I spent on that head of lettuce is now in my trash can. But if I buy a tub of the pre-washed lettuce leaves, yes, it's more expensive, but we'll eat the entire thing. Okay, well, all of a sudden, that $3.50 for the tub I just spent is a lot better use of the money compared to the $1.89 I just threw in the garbage. If it helps you to look for those convenient type options, explore the produce section to see what might help you include vegetables more often. Frozen veggies. Gosh, five minutes in the microwave and your side dish is done. Doesn't get easier than that. And our last category, fruit. Different ways to add fruit. Now, for some reason, fruit seems to be easier than vegetables to incorporate probably because it's a bit sweeter, but add it to your hot or cold cereal, and that could be fresh or frozen fruit. Sneak it on a sandwich or blend it up with some water or milk and ice. Add a little yogurt for a creamy texture, and it's almost like eating ice cream or a dessert, but you're getting the benefit of more fruit. Freeze them, layer them, but ideally, just like when it comes to vegetables, have them available. Cut them or wash them. If it's your grapes, wash them and separate them so you already have them ready to go. Buy them in a canned version or the fruit cups, but if you do, get them in juice, light syrup, or a coconut water so you're not just getting a ton of the extra sugar that comes from a heavy syrup. The link to the website I have at the bottom gives you some great options for how to incorporate fruits and vegetables, not only in side dishes, but also main dishes. And as I'm looking at that, I'm already realizing it needs to be changed. The website is actually osfhealthcare.org backslash recipes. So I apologize, that website needs to get updated. osfhealthcare.org backslash recipes. This is kind of the 
other category, more of our legumes, so your beans, peas, nuts, and seeds. Now, the traditional Western or American diet doesn't include a lot of beans. International diets tend to incorporate beans more often, but it can be easy to add them to soups, on top of salads, in a mixed dish, or in a side dish, just by cracking open the can, rinsing them off, and literally dumping in them into your ingredient or your recipe or your salad. Maybe it's a spread, something like hummus, which is made from chickpeas or garbanzo beans, works well as a dip for vegetables, chips, or even as a mayonnaise replacement for a sandwich. Or considering something like a trail mix that adds nuts, dried fruit, and whole grains into a snackable form. And the nice thing with that is here in central Illinois, you can leave that trail mix in your car all year round because it's not going to melt in the summer or freeze in the winter. If you're running in between doctor's appointments, instead of having to drive through uh, McDonald's or somewhere else for fast food, maybe you grab a handful of your trail mix. Now you've got some of your healthy fiber, healthy fat, some good balanced whole grain options. That's going to tide you over so you can get home and make a better food choice than you would have if you were left to your own disposal, running to and from appointments or whatnot. Regardless of how you start, go slowly. Okay? I only recommend about a five gram increase in fiber per week until you reach your goal. Because if you add too much too quickly, you're going to get what we call the greenhouse gas effect. You and everybody else around you is going to know you're miserable because you're going to feel constipated, bloated, and kind of gassy. Drink plenty of water and incorporate activity as you go along. And be sure to include a variety of fiber sources so you get the benefit of all the nutrition. Eating 10 apples a day is certainly going to give you a ton of fiber, but it's only going to give you the vitamins and minerals that those 10 apples provide. So change it up. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds. How can you add them to your day-to-day, -day, whether that's entrees, side dishes, or snacking, so that you maximize fiber intake and feel the best by doing it? Thank you for your time today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.